come across to the deliver tab and this is our last stage before we export um, everything and you can see on this left hand side we basically got some options custom YouTube Vimeo different delivery methods there Final Cut XML Premiere XML if you're going to be taking things back you can do it via XML personally I think if you're going to be taking this on to an, another editor I'd just go straight out into a custom choose your preferred editing codec and then just work with them from there uh, and at this point as well, once you've taken all of these clips and you've come, you've come out to an Apple ProRes or a DNX HD, you could essentially get rid of your RAWs because especially if you use the codecs I'm gonna to suggest to in a minute, you're still gonna have quite a big file with good dynamic range and the ability for you to tweak it because it's gonna still be kind of up the 12, 16 bit kind of area. Um, you're not gonna have changed it dramatically in terms of not be, you know, it's not gone to an 8-bit file all of a sudden. So you've still got some scope to do some tweaking if you need to in that editor. So the way we tend to do things is we go individual clips and what we're gonna do is a video, export video, quick time, Apple ProRes 422HQ. The one I generally go out to would either be the ProRes 4444XQ or the one beneath it. Either of those would be fine. I'm working on a Mac. If you're working on a PC, you're going to look, want to look at the DNX HD flavors. Lots of different ones to choose from. I think this one here is going to preserve the maximum quality. And certainly this one here for us preserves the maximum quality. Don't worry about field rendering render at source resolution. In this instance, we're gonna go out at UHD clips, but you could very easily go to 1080 at this point and have it scale down to 1080 if you just want 1080 clips. In the advanced settings, nothing much to look at here really. You do wanna make sure that if you have optimized your media, this is not checked. If it is checked, it's gonna use whatever format that you use for your optimized media to export with, and that's not gonna do you any favors when you're taking out raw. You may as well have the, the best file size possible. So from my point of view, just leave that unchecked. Everything else I pretty much leave off. I tick these two options at the bottom for sizing to the highest quality, especially if we are going to minimize or, and scale down our, our frame from a the full source resolution down to a lower resolution uh, or scale up even. I would definitely, definitely, definitely be checking this one to make sure you've got the very best quality in your scale. Uh, the debayering, I, I just like to force it to the highest quality. I don't actually know if it does anything sort of help, really helpful, but um, I, it certainly feels good. It feels like I'm gonna get the very best quality by doing that, so I tend to check it. Um, and certainly the ones I've checked, I haven't checked that box, haven't seemed to be quite as, quite as good in terms of the quality of the file. So I tend to just leave it like that. Go into audio, I turn the audio off in this instance because we don't need to export any audio. And then in terms of the file, this is where DaVinci Resolve does this better than any other editor. If you are doing aerial work and you're producing clips to then hand on to somebody else, this is gonna save you so much time because you've trimmed, you've done some, some basic processing and you're ready to export and you now don't want to export one big timeline and hand over one big file for people to then clip, you know, cut through themselves. You wanna give them individual clips. So as I said, what this does very well is it gives you the ability to either use a custom name or source name. We're gonna go for source name we're gonna use unique file names and add a suffix. And I'm gonna change it to just three digits. And now what this is basically gonna do is it's gonna use this original source name down here, but it's then gonna add a suffix. And what's great about that is in this instance, we've got two files, two clips, both that which have the same file name because obviously it was originally the same clip, but we've chopped it in the middle and we do want to see it as two separate clips, but we do also want to know that this clip we don't want to give it a brand new file name because we want to know that it actually came from this original source clip. So the way I, I've set it up here gives us the option to essentially, and I'll just get my doc up and I'll show you, when we go back to this file structure over here, you'll see that for the Blenheim Palace job completed video, here are our ProRes files. This is where we, again, exported these finished files to. And you can see there's the original source file and then I know that this is video 1001 video 1002 and so on and so there's actually 25 clips there but you'll notice that for example not all of them came from some of them came from the same source clip and some of them came from individual sort of completely different ones there's not a complete sequence there because some of them say uh, like number five here might have been a bad clip when we started recording on and chucked it away so 
that's great because all of a sudden we've got a brand new set of clips there that still maintain some kind of noting back to the actual original clip that they went back to. Okay, so that's a little bit about the file name. So you just need to choose where to put it. Again, like any other, find a place to put it wherever you're happy. Click, click OK, that's where they'll all go. Once you've got these settings all good and you're happy and ready to go with those, the only thing you need to do is add to render queue. I'm gonna, I need to set a destination, so I'm just gonna choose a destination uh, there. Okay, and now it's added to the render queue. So we've got job one, seven clips, ready to go. And the great thing about this is if you have a variety of clips that you want to do differently, so maybe these three clips I'm gonna do differently, and then these four I'm gonna do in another way, what you can do is actually just set up initially, and instead of rendering the entire timeline, just do either the in and out range, and you can actually, what you do is you mark your in and out range, like so, so you can just do maybe, there we go, these three, these three clips a particular way, and then we're gonna do these three clips a different way. You can add multiple jobs with different settings over here. To the, to the render queue. And then obviously you go away, get a cup of tea, come back and it's all done for you. So that's what's really, really handy. And you'll see job one, seven clips, ready to go. Simply start render, it will go off and render. And when you come back and it's all finished, the clips will be where you put them and you have got successfully a very good quick workflow where you've either edited your footage in Resolve and it's already gone out. You've maybe even you've already put it out to YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, or you've got a whole stack of clips ready to hand on to your editor that you've been able to get the very most of the dynamic range from the camera and make sure that the clips look as good as you want them to. And the crucial thing is that we haven't had that step in After Effects where we've had to wait for the extra, st extra step of processing and we haven't needed to just, again, put that extra step in before we can even really start working quickly with the files. In After Effects, it just, it's just not set up yet to edit and work quickly with these DNG sequences. So that's the end of the workflow. Sorry it was a long video. I hope this has been helpful for a lot of you. If you have enjoyed it and watched it, then please do give us a like, uh, a thumbs up. Do hit subscribe if you wanna know a little bit more. I think what we're gonna do is a few more videos based on the X5R workflow, maybe dive in a little bit deeper to power windows. And again, we didn't even speak about keyframing. So when it comes to keyframing, again, you can change your color correction over time, which again is something that you can't do in After Effects. And it's very, very easy to do. So do let me know in the comments if that's a video you'd like to see. And as I say, hit subscribe and also do look out for some workshops coming up very soon. If you're sort of around in our area uh, towards the east of England, we're gonna be running some workshops to teach drone pilots basically who haven't got a background in cameras or editing how to get the very best out of their camera and how to go about the editing process, talking about codecs, formats, timelines, color grading, all that good stuff. So again, if you're interested in that and you'd like some more information, you can hit us up with some of the details in the video description below. I'll try and put as much of the information in there as I can. Otherwise, thank you very, very much indeed for watching. Hope you enjoy this workflow and you're able to start implementing it with your, with your aerial footage. Thank you very much, guys. Speak to you next time. Bye.